pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hey guys, good morning and welcome to the online gathering. If you have your Bibles handy, we're going to take a look at Psalm 150. And it says, Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and with harp. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's Psalm 150. It's the last psalm in the entire book of Psalms. And the interesting thing about this psalm is it starts out with a specific word in Hebrew that means to address in a loud tone. It literally means to shout. It means to commend and glory and triumph. And we just are coming off of Easter, and we have seen the most incredible thing that anything has ever happened in history. My encouragement to you is worship in light of that incredible revelation. So we're about to sing some songs. My encouragement to you is to sing along and sing as loud as you possibly can.
praise and hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief.
truly satisfy Oh Lord, you satisfy me Like nobody else can Lord, you satisfy me Satisfy me like nobody else can. Lord, you satisfy me. You give me life in abundance, joyful and complete. And your steadfast love is so much better. Satisfy me like nobody else can. Lord, you satisfy me. Oh, Lord, you satisfy me like nobody else can. Lord, you satisfy me. In your presence, there is fullness of joy at your right. Set the Lord always before me, because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life, and your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Good morning, church. Please join me in a time of corporate prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for prayer. Thank you so much that we get to come to you with our requests. Thank you so much that you listen to us. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God who has designed the universe to work with prayer. That you have made your people participants in in the work that you are doing and that prayer is one of those things that is essential to your plan thank you so much for that for that beautiful truth father i ask today as we watch the sermon and as we hear the sermon that we would believe that you listen to prayer and that you are a good father who wants to hear the prayers of his children. Father, we don't annoy you with our prayers. We don't harass you with our prayers. You are a God who listens to our prayers and you are delighted to answer them. Father, I pray that we believe that. And I ask that in the name of my precious Savior, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church. 
Uh, I'm glad and excited you guys are here. We're starting a new series today and I have been eagerly anticipating this with us. Uh, we're gonna be starting a series today going for the next four weeks on prayer in the life of the church. Um, we're gonna be looking to the Lord's Prayer as kind of a structure and a model to kind of lead us off into certain aspects of prayer in the life of the church and, and how we can engage that. Each week, uh, and you already saw this today, but each week we're going to have someone from the body read and lead us in the Lord's Prayer to kind of lead off our time. And then when we get into the sermon, we'll, we'll snag a different piece of that prayer as kind of a jumping off point to take us into the Word and, and talk about prayer in our lives. Today we're going to be talking about the opening of the Lord's Prayer and this idea of our Father who is in heaven. Um, I'm getting way ahead of myself. So before we get too deep into our series today, I do want to take a minute and talk about um, why we're having this discussion. We've talked a ton uh, this year about 2020 as being a year where Red Tree was going to really focus in on this idea of the mission of God. You know, we talk um, a lot about our discipleship rhythms. Every gathering, we start off talking about who we are, are as a church and our convictions around this idea of Jesus' family mission. And we said in 2020, we're going to set aside time to really dig in and understand what does it mean to be on the mission of God, to participate in mission, to participate in mission with Jesus. Um, and that's Man, that's an important question if, if it's something that, that's so deep and foundational to who we are. So what does that actually mean, right? Like how do we actually participate in the mission of God? Uh, last week in Easter, we read uh, the Great Commission passage in Matthew 28 as part of the resurrection story. And in that, Jesus talks about or challenges or calls his church, you and me included, into this proclamation mission that we are to go, go into the world, into our world where we work, where we live and play and actually proclaim the gospel message, the message that Jesus is God and his death and his resurrection made a way to save us from our sins and draw us into fellowship and eternity and intimacy with God. We are called to actually proclaim that with our lives, with our actions, with our words, and invite other people to participate in that same truth. You and I get to do this. I mean, we say this a lot at Red Tree, but, but you are the missionary, right? Wherever you work, live, and play, God has put you into people's lives and put you in the circles you're in so that you can share with Jesus in the work that he's actually doing. And that's an exciting thing, right? But what's a Christian to do with that call in the midst of social distancing and a lockdown, right? We're, we're not having our neighbors over for dinner. You're not inviting coworkers to study scripture with you over your lunch break. You're not jumping into community service events or things like that. And yet the mission of God does not end during a shelter at home order, even though our public activity does. So what do we actually do with that? That's what kind of brought me to the genesis of this series together. I had been considering what we would do after Easter. Our original plan was to do a really practical series about what it means for us uh, to engage the truth of the gospel with the lost world. And we're, we'll still do that. We'll probably jump into that series this fall. But as I was as I was thinking about that and, and all of us kind of stuck at home and watching church on our TV, it just didn't seem like it made a ton of sense or didn't seem fully uh, respectable to the situation to jump into that series right now. And as I spent time praying over what we could share and what we could do together as a church to really zone us in on the beautiful call that is mission, I feel like God kept bringing me back to this passage in Matthew 9. So let me, let me read this for us. This is Matthew 9, starting in verse 35, and it says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, 
The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know, I I know that's probably a familiar text for a lot of you, but that really brought me back to just a ton of clarity to the, the truth I think we need in this time at Red Tree Church. Beloved, Prayer is the way forward for our church and for the kingdom of God, period. This is the way forward for Red Tree Church. Are we praying to the Lord of the harvest? Now, I know that this is one of the most stereotypical things a pastor can talk to you about, right? Like if you talk to a pastor and they don't tell you to read your Bible more and pray more, like can you actually even say you were talking to a pastor? But, but the reality is like, I think we all can acknowledge that prayer is something we should talk about. I mean, I think even those of us who would say you are knocking it out of the park in your prayer life, and that's a spiritual discipline that comes easy to you, or you find a lot of life and joy in that, we can always grow in our discipline and our joy and our intimacy in how we understand prayer. And by the way, just being a little confessional, I want to go out on a limb and say probably most of us wouldn't say that we're hitting it out of the park in our prayer life. I know for me personally, I struggle with the spiritual discipline of prayer. It feels sometimes like I'm waffling back and forth between what practically amounts to prayerlessness and then what amounts to just kind of this white knuckling, disciplining, forcing myself into structures of prayer lists and journals. And it just seems like I waffle back and forth. Now, now don't, don't hear me say like I don't pray, right? Like I find life and joy and intimacy in communing with God. But what I am confessing to you guys, and and I think is probably a confession a lot of us would share together, is that prayer is hard. And for a lot of us, it's not the most natural way that we connect to Christ. And, And it is hard to kind of figure out what it looks like to have a healthy and consistent prayer life. But beloved, hear this, nothing that we desire to accomplish in this life, in this world, in the kingdom of God, through our mission, through our proclamation, nothing good that we actually desire in our own life, in our family, in our future, with our kids, nothing that we're seeking will we be able to accomplish apart from the help of God. He is our Lord. He is our sovereign Lord. He ultimately is the worker. And we get to ask the Lord of the harvest that if we can jump in and work with him while he does it. You know, this this text in Matthew reminds me of the analogy of like a kid, a young kid who goes to work with dad. I don't know uh, how many of you guys have young kids right now, or, or, or maybe those of you have older kids if you remember this, but one of the things I love about my daughter is that she loves to work with me, whether I'm sitting at my desk writing or studying for church, or I'm in the backyard mowing, or I'm working on the car. She loves to work with me, but If you have a four-year-old or you remember having a four-year-old, she doesn't really work with me, right? She grabs uh, a plastic keyboard and pretends to type on it while I'm writing. She grabs some scissors and comes and cuts grass while I'm doing something. She grabs toy tools and plays with them next to me. Really what she does is she plays with me while I do the work. I love that analogy because That is how God expands and moves his kingdom forward. God is the one who's moving his kingdom forward. He's the one who's seeking and saving the lost. He's the one who's convicting hearts of sin and drawing the dead to life and growing the church and doing the work. And we get invited to come alongside him and participate in the work as best as we can. But as best as we can is my four-year-old helping me fix the car. It's really us being with our good dad who's doing the work for us. 
And this brings me back to just this overarching idea of when we talk about our prayer life, specifically in reference to the call on every believer to be on mission, we are talking about the life blood of the church because we are asking our good dad to do the work that he has already been doing and to let us be there with him while he does it. There's a Ugandan theologian named Emmanuel Cantangole, and he said it like this, the first language of the church in a deeply broken world is not strategy, but prayer. We are called to a space where the right response of the church can only be a desperate cry directed to God. Which brings us to today. Mary opened our time with the Lord's Prayer. Thank you for that, Mary. That was awesome. And today I want us to focus on these opening words for a moment. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our prayer life starts with the reality that we are addressing our good Father in heaven. Now, we could spend hours talking about the weightiness behind the biblical image of God as a Father, but, but, but let, let, let me summarize it like this. God's love and relationship to us is analogous to the perfect idealization of fatherhood. God is a good father who cares for, leads, and delights in his children. I know some of you don't have that kind of relationship with your father. In fact, I would say even those of us who have a great relationship with our dad still have fallible, sinful dads who despite their best efforts hurt us. This is the nature of life in a broken and fallen world, which really brings us to our text today. If we're gonna take time to talk about prayer as this conversation, this connection with our Father in heaven, then we have to reconcile the reality of the perfect heavenly ideal of God as the good Father and our understanding of our earthly fathers, which is perfect because Jesus gives us this parable in Luke chapter 18 about prayer to our good father, and he specifically designs it to kind of cut through some of the brokenness of our understanding of fatherhood in, in, in the broken world. So turn with me to Luke chapter 18. We're going to read, uh, starting in the first verse here, it says this, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And this is the word of the Lord. Beloved, pray with me. Jesus, as we take a few minutes to address this text, to, to talk about your goodness as our Father and the way you provide for us, we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be our interpreter today, that you would speak to us the truth of your word, that you would illuminate the truth in this, that we would be convicted of sin, that we would be reminded of aspects of you that we've forgotten, that we would be drawn to truths about you. And ultimately, God, that, that as we finish out this time in our homes, with our families, engaging in church, that, that we would walk away from this having spent our morning with you. We love you, Jesus. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So, what a strange story, and yet what a delightful one, right? Like, we have God here giving a parable about the ways we relate to him in prayer, and the analogy he uses is a self-seeking, corrupt, 
terrible person abusing their position and authority for personal gain and a marginalized person in desperate need for help. It's weird, right? It, it, the whole setup of the story is weird in a story that you already know is supposed to teach you about God's character. Keep in mind the fact that unlike most of Jesus's parables, this one gives you the meaning right out of the bat. Before we even get to the parable, Luke has already told you what the parable is about. And Jesus usually doesn't play that way, right? Like Jesus teaches with parables often, but usually he's pretty coy about the meaning right? Like he likes to kind of leave you hanging and let you reflect on the words and think about it and let the meaning kind of come to you. But we don't get that here. We get the meaning right out of the bait, right, right off the bat. And we get this really simple and strange story. But I think when it comes down to it, this story is really worth our consideration. So here's, here's what I'd like to do for us. Uh, this parable is really simple. So what I'm gonna do is just point out a couple cultural textual issues that I think will help kind of clarify for us, give us a clear understanding of what's going on here. Ultimately, as the meaning of the text becomes a little more clear, we're gonna end our time by jumping back to Jesus's teaching on prayer in Matthew 6, and then we'll end out our time with communion. So the story here is really simple. There's a terrible judge who's self-serving and doesn't care about justice and doesn't care about God. And there is a widow over here in need of justice. She essentially bothers this judge until he finally relents to give her the justice she desires because of his annoyance. And then Jesus tacks on the end with the saying, if the unjust judge will give justice because of bickering, how much more will God give justice to those who cry to him continually? And that's it, right? Unjust judge doesn't like to give justice, doesn't care about people. Widow bugs him. He finally gives in. Hey, God's so much better. The end. And then he moves on. Now, there's a couple things we need to think about here before we jump into the actual meat of this text. The first one is to remember, this is a parable, right? This is one of Jesus's most common forms of teaching where he uses these stories to kind of analogously or kind of point us to more abstract truths of the kingdom or hard to understand truths of the Christian life. Usually they're a little more mysterious than this. And usually, although our text today is kind of a striking, um, maybe diversion from this, usually these parables are pretty, pretty explicitly about Jesus. Um, and while there are interesting thoughts and parallels and things you can study about how this text speaks into Jesus' own prayer life, that's kind of outside the scope of what we're going to be talking about today. If you're interested in that kind of stuff, if you're nerd out in theology, you can always reach out to me. I can send you stuff. But, but really, what we're going to look at here and what this text mainly focuses on is the idea of how the church lives out its prayer life in the midst of the kingdom of God that is present but not yet, right? And we're, we're going to talk about all that language as we continue on. But the, the main thing we're looking at in this, and, and Jesus says it like right out of the bat, or Luke tells us this, is that this parable is to encourage you to pray and not lose heart, right? This is for the church and for the church's prayer life as they engage in kingdom life here and now pursuing the mission of God. The other piece to this is that this story is in the gospel of Luke, and this is kind of important for us and that it kind of sets up this parable a little bit. Luke of the four gospels, the four books that tell the story of Jesus's life, Luke is the one that most focuses on the marginalized and on justice for the hurt and the oppressed and those who are unseen. Um, that, that, that plays out because Mark is, or Mark, Luke is really interested a lot of times in kind of societal injustice and broken society systemic sin and power dynamics and all these things. And that comes out really bluntly in our story today. The setup here is of an unrighteous judge. Now, really quick, that was a common enough thing in Jesus's day. Although the Jewish people did their best 
to try their own cases through religious courts kind of made up of rabbis and priests and leaders through uh, the synagogue system and the temple system. Um, there were also secular judges in every major metroplex that were appointed by the Roman government who could try civil cases. And even though the Jewish people tried to avoid that, they, they did exist. Now, our person seeking justice is a widow. This part is, is just as important and just kind of as much kind of plays into some of the Lucan stereotypes of how, how, how we talk about the gospel. But you would be hard pressed to find someone more oppressed and more marginalized in Jesus' day and Jesus' culture than a widow. Um, widows were people who, who really had society stacked against them, especially if the widow was older. The problem would be if she was too old to remarry, if she didn't have kids or family or parents who were alive who would take her in, she was left in this really untenable social situation. And in Jewish culture in Jesus's day, she would not be able to sign her own legal documents or take care of her property or manage her money. She would need a man to sign stuff with her and for her, which essentially just left her really, really vulnerable to be abused, to be taken advantage of, to be extorted. And so what honestly ended up happening in Jesus's day is that even though a lot of widows would attempt to upkeep their household and their estates, a lot of the times they end up destitute, begging or turning to things like crime or prostitution. And so you have this widow who has been wronged in some way. It doesn't tell us what way, but the reality is it doesn't matter all that much because there were tons of ways, even legal ways, that this woman could be wronged and oppressed and taken advantage of. And she needs justice. And for whatever reason, she cannot find justice in the Jewish court system. Maybe the person who's oppressing her um, is someone of wealth or someone of notoriety or someone in power or someone involved in the justice system. Maybe they haven't actually done anything technically illegal by Jewish law, or maybe even worse, she's just too small fish to fry. For whatever reason, she can't get on the docket. But the public Roman judges have to hear every case. So she can bring her case to this secular judge. The catch, as the story tells us, is that this judge does not care about us, all right? Or does not care about her. He doesn't fear God. He doesn't care about justice. You're talking about a dude who's just collecting a government paycheck and most likely a ton of bribes. And when this lady comes to him, who's marginalized and oppressed and hurting, seeking justice, he has to hear the case, but he doesn't have to do anything about it. So he doesn't. And she just keeps coming back. I, I, I love the way Luke sets this up for us. This is very typical of a Luke kind of story. This woman who's unjustly beat down by a broken system, but she does not give up. She has no other options. She is totally dependent on this judge to give her justice and she expects justice. So she's persistent. She comes back over and over and over and over demanding that this judge do his job and give her justice. Eventually the judge is so beat down by her persistence that he gives in and gives her the justice she's looking for. Look, look, look at his reasoning. Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this woman keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. I think this is one of the strangest and most humorous texts in the Gospels. This woman basically annoys this judge into giving her justice, and she actually gets it. And Jesus is just like, all right, that's it. That's the whole story. And then he tags onto the end. Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give them justice speedily. So, so, so do you see this? Jesus takes this story that, that really is just a horrible situation that still results in justice that the woman is looking for, and he points it back to God. 
Look at this horrible scenario. Things, you would be hard for things to be much worse than this poor widow's situation. And yet, look what happened to her by her persistence, by her humility, by her dependence, by her expectation, like justice was still brought about. You're not in that kind of terrible situation. You have access to a good father who actually cares about you and actually cares about justice. So how much better will things be for you? So, so really quick, there are three truths or kind of points to the story I feel like we have to understand if we're going to really zone in on the truth for us today. The first one is this. It's the nature of the judge. Now, the judge in the story was selfish and sinful, but our father is not like this. We have a good father who desires the best for us. Like, I feel like if you hear nothing else out of this, you you have to come back to this truth that your father in heaven, who you pray to, our God, the God who sent Jesus, who made us, who sustains us, knows you and loves you and desires the best for you. We, We have to know the nature of the judge that we are seeking, the nature of our good father in heaven. And his nature is good. He has good for you. He delights to hear from you. He delights to provide for you. He delights to bring justice for you. And he will not delay. Come on. Second, we have to look at the actions of the widow. Look how this woman approaches the judge. I'm going to point out three things here. She is dependent, she is persistent, and she is expectant. Think about this for a moment. She has no other options. If you had an option besides the selfish, unjust judge, you would pick that option. But this is all she has. She needs this judge to carry out justice on her behalf. She has no power to fix her own situation. She understands her dependency on this judge. Because of that, she is persistent. She won't give up. She comes back over and over and over and over. And the reason she's able to come back over and over and over is because she's actually expectant of justice. Even though she knows the nature of this judge, this woman, for whatever reason, has it like burned into her heart that justice is actually a thing she can have and obtain. And so she comes back to this judge depending on him persistently over and over and over. She's dependent, she's persistent, she's expectant. Beloved, that that speaks into how we understand our prayer life. But before we talk about that piece, we have to talk about this third truth of this text. And this one is probably the one that's easiest for us to breeze over. And that's this. This widow is seeking justice. I don't know if you caught that, but the text repeats this word or this idea of justice over and over. Now, now justice is a huge theme in all of Luke and in all of the Bible. Biblically speaking, justice is the idea of seeking for wrongs to be made right. Ultimately, this is understood biblically in the overarching story of the gospel. God is making right what sin has broken. Ultimate justice will be God's restoration of all things at the end times when Christ returns and eternity in heaven begins. That will be the ultimate expression of justice. This is connected to the larger truth of this text. This story, and kind of catch this, this is given right in the middle of Jesus' final march toward Jerusalem. We've talked about this a ton over the last few weeks, kind of with Holy Week, right? But, But Jesus has accepted the mantle of his Messiahship and is marching toward Jerusalem to face his death and and ultimately buy a way for life for us through his death and his resurrection. And as he's making his way to Jerusalem, he's giving these kind of final teachings on the kingdom to his followers. 
kind of trying to prepare them for his upside down kingdom, for how set apart and different his messiahship is, for how much it's going to subvert their expectations. And in chapter 17, right before our text, Jesus gives us a truth about the kingdom of God that his church is a part of, and it's really important for us. It's this idea. The kingdom of God is here and now, but it is also yet to come. In other words, the kingdom of God is already, but it is not yet. Think about that with me for a moment. This is a, a real important truth Jesus comes back to with his followers. But, but this is even true for us on the other side of the resurrection, right? Like if you receive Christ and you receive salvation, you receive forgiveness, you have that. You are adopted into the kingdom. You have the Holy Spirit. You have forgiveness from sins. You have life in Christ. You have the community and fellowship of the church. There are so many pieces of the kingdom that are right here, right now now immediate that you experience in Christ. And yet we know that the kingdom is not fully fulfilled until Christ returns and makes all things new. We have the Holy Spirit, we have the church, we have salvation, we have forgiveness, but we also have these bodies of flesh. And we also have these dead sin natures that are at war within us. And we also live in a world and a society that is at best indifferent and at worst violent against the truth of the kingdom. And we have an enemy, Satan, who is actively seeking to kill and destroy and, 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 and mess up the work of the church and the work of the kingdom. And so we're stuck in this space of already but not yet where we are longing for ultimate justice. We're longing for the return of Christ, the ultimate fulfillment of his kingdom. We long for Christ to return, to make all things new, to finally destroy sin and death and the curse in completion and to set things up how they are supposed to be. This is the justice Jesus is referring to when he gives us this parable. Think about that, right? This parable is about seeking justice, not just seeking what the woman wants. She's seeking justice. And he gives this parable right after going through this hard teaching about how his church will suffer in the already but not yet waiting for his return. And the point of the parable, right, is that they would pray and not lose heart. Jesus is zoning in on this reality that in the already but not yet kingdom, we long for the final justice of Christ's return and the restoration of all things. That is what the woman prays for. It's what the woman seeks of the judge with her persistence and her dependence and her expectation. Now, remember those three things who the judge actually is, how the widow engages him, and what the widow is actually seeking. I was getting a little bit ahead of myself, but all of this speaks into how we pray and how we engage our good father. So, so jump back with me to the widow. She's persistent, she's dependent, she's expectant. Think of how this sort of posture affects our understanding of prayer. Jesus uses the language in the parable, crying out day and night to describe the kind of perseverance in prayer he's talking about. Jesus is essentially challenging the church, you and me, to try and annoy God with our prayers. You can't do it. But it's not just the persistence. It's not just crying out, pleading to God day and night. It's also this idea of dependence. The widow could not have justice without the intervention of the judge, and we cannot have the kingdom without the intervention of our good God. He must intervene. It will not happen without him. We are completely dependent on God to work out his gospel plan and bring the dead to life and save us. So yeah, we, we come to him persistently, but we come to him dependently. And, and beyond this, we come to him expectantly. See, God promised 
that he would restore what sin broke. Jesus promised that he would return and make all things new and take us with him into eternal perfection. And beloved of Jesus, hear this. The promise of God is as good as accomplished. If God has promised it, it will come to be. And Jesus has promised that he will return. So when we pray, we can be persistent. We can cry out day and night we, because we know that we are dependent on God, that, that things won't happen unless he makes them happen. And we can do it with expectancy because he has promised that he will fulfill this gospel story, that he will return, that he will make you and I to raise to life in perfection and in unity and intimacy with him for all time. With one caveat, with one caveat. And this, by the way, is so important in our day and age. You see, the widow doesn't just pray with consistency, dependency, and expectancy. She also prays for justice. We just, we just talked about this, but, but, but I want you to bring this really practically to you and I's life right here and right now. What we pray for is just as important as how we pray for it. Well, let me say that one more time. What we pray for is just as important as how we pray for it. You see, many of us are so prayerless in our day-to-day -day lives that we think the issue is our lack of effort. If only we prayed more, if only we prayed better, then we would see God move and we would solve our problems. But while lack of effort is an issue, we, we can all agree that we should pray more, right? The real issue is how we see God and what we are actually asking of him. You see, we live in a day where the prosperity gospel has perverted the true biblical gospel all over the world. We think that if we learn the right methods or the right disciplines of prayer, we can make God our personal genie or vending machine who will spill out blessing and comfort and happiness and stuff and relationships. But beloved, this is not the case. And really quick, don't deceive yourself into thinking that just because you're not praying for God to give you a million dollars and a new car and nice clothes, that you have not fallen for the trap of the prosperity gospel. The minute you believe your prayer exists to convince God to give you what you want, even if what you want is good stuff like family, relationships, marriage, happiness, contentment, safety, whatever, if you have fallen into the trap that prayers for you to convince God to give you what you want, you have fallen for the trap of the prosperity gospel. What you ask your father for in prayer is just as important as how how you pray. We should ask how we pray. The widow did not seek out stuff. She didn't seek out relationships or comforts or happiness. She was seeking justice. She was seeking for wrong to be made right. Beloved, we should ask how we pray. It's a good question, but it's only one of the questions. We should ask how we pray. We should ask what we're praying for. Now, please don't mishear me. Of course you can bring your desires to God. He loves to hear from you. He loves to hear the desires of your heart. He loves to give, give, give good gifts to his children, no matter how petty, no matter how small, but ultimately the root, the foundation, the core of your prayer life should be seeking God for justice, biblical justice, the restoration of all things, the return of Jesus, the salvation of lost souls, the righting of the wrong that is the curse. This is the prayer God hears and will answer quickly. God will bring justice because his promises are as good as accomplished. Beloved, how often do you pray for God to bring about his kingdom here and now? 
How often do we pray for real justice against sin to return and establish his kingdom on earth? How often do our prayers come back to asking Christ to return and restore all things, asking the Lord of the harvest to send workers to seek and save the lost, to draw the dead to life, the dead in our own lives, our family, our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends. How often is our prayer asking our good father to bring about real biblical justice? The righting of wrongs, the restoration of all things, the bringing of the dead back to life. That is the prayer that Jesus hears and hears quickly. Not that you can't tell God or shouldn't tell God about your desires and the small pieces of your life. He loves it. He loves you. He loves to hear from you. But don't be deceived by some evangelical version of the prosperity gospel, where all your prayer is about getting what you want from God. Bring your prayers back to the truth of the Bible that God is going to restore all things. Bring that cry for justice, for restoration, for Christ's return. Bring that to him often and see what he does with your heart. And all this is because of the final truth of this text. We should be asking how we pray and we should be asking what we're praying for. But ultimately, we need to be asking, we need to remember who we are praying to. Beloved of Jesus, you have a good father in heaven, a good father who delights in you Because of Christ, because of his finished work on the cross, because of his perfect life, his perfect death, his perfect resurrection, you have been washed in the blood of Christ and your good father delights in you. He delights to hear from you. He delights to meet your needs. He delights to deliver justice, to seek and save the lost. He's been working on this gospel story from before the beginning of time. And no matter how often you pray or how you pray or what you pray for, you must bring yourself back to the truth. Do you truly know who you are praying to? Jump back with me to Matthew 6. This is Uh, the same text where we read the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of our gathering. Read, Read this with me. This is Matthew 6, starting in verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go to your father, go to your room, And shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Beloved, you see this. You have a good father He sees you. He knows what you need. And he's good. This is the absolute foundation of our prayer life. Before we talk about prayer techniques or how good we are or disciplines or structures or even subjects of prayer, before we get to any of that stuff, all awesome stuff that we should be talking about, that we should be digging in, we have to come back to this bedrock foundational truth that you have a good father who sees you and knows you and loves you and delights to meet your needs. And even as I say that, I know Satan is already lying to some of you and whispering in your heart about what about this and what about that and what about the time this happened? Why didn't God do this? Beloved, push those lies aside and hear this. You have a good father. 
who sees you, who knows you, knows what you need before you even ask. And he delights to care for you. Delights to care for you. We're gonna talk a lot over the next month about praying for the kingdom and praying consistently and learning to be dependent. And, and before any of that will have any teeth, we have to remember at the end of the day, prayer is all about who you're praying to. I've said it 50 times and I'll close with the same truth. Beloved, when we pray, we are praying to our good father sees you. He knows you. He loves you. And he is good. Amen. Beloved of Jesus, as we end out our time, I wanna invite you guys to grab some elements. We're gonna take communion together to kind of close out our time together. You know, we just read from the word and we just sang a song about the goodness of our God, the goodness of our Father in heaven. And I know, I know that some of you guys wrestle with that. That there are just pieces of your story, hurts in your story, wrongs done to you that just make it really hard to accept and acknowledge and live in the goodness of our Father. If that's you this morning, and first off, know that you are always invited to reach out to your pastors. We would love to work through what God is doing in your heart with you. And whatever it is, whether it's something heavy like that or even just something practical of, I'm convicted, I wanna pray more, what do I do? We, we, we wanna be in that with you. Um, please reach out. We'd love to connect with you. But, but specifically, if you're in this space and discussion of God as a good father is painful for you, I want to invite you to really consider communion as we take it in a moment. The scripture says when we take of these elements and we take of the bread and we take of the juice that we are reflecting or declaring or remembering the death of Jesus, his suffering, 
his body broken, his blood of the new covenant poured out, and its sufficiency. That his death was enough to make a way for us from, from death to life. I want to encourage you guys that, man, if, if, if you struggle to really believe, to really live in the goodness of God, let communion be a reminder to you of God's goodness. Because that, that good God was willing to let his body be broken for us. And he was willing to have his blood poured out as a new covenant for us to invite us to a table we couldn't go to on our own. So beloved, if you want to worship with that declaration this morning, I would invite you to come and take and eat. Guys, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. It's so good to see you in the ways that we can. Hopefully, whatever platform you're watching this on, you get to comment and connect with people and be reminded of faces and families and people that you love. We love you guys. It's such a privilege to be church family, to serve you and, and be with you in this time. I want to say again, if you have any needs, whether they're really practical or whether they're intimate and spiritual needs, please reach out. Your pastors love you. We're here for you. Hopefully, we'll see you this week in whatever ways we can through uh, teleconferencing and gospel community and discipleship. Uh, beloved, we love you. We'll see you again. Go in peace.